um, basically, I think every one of you knows this already, a blockchain is a decentralized database in which data is collected immutable or immutably in blocks which exist on every node on the network. Um, and these blocks form a chain and this is a blockchain, right? Um, and LISC is um, a decentralized and very energy efficient network and it is running on its own blockchain and in the following slides I will just refer to it as a main chain. Um, currently the network has around 600 peers and it is utilizing the DPoS, the Delegated Proof of Stake Consensus Algorithm, um, in which delegates take care of block generation. Um, LISC is also an ultra-fast and secure cryptocurrency. Um, it has its own, their own coins with the ticker symbol LSK, um, and you can send and receive LSK within 10 seconds. This is possible because of the DPoS consensus algorithm. Um, and with secure, I mean that we have some more advanced security features like second by the key, um, which is quite similar to two-factor two authentication, um, but you can also set up a multi-signature um, account to secure your funds even further. Um, let me briefly explain you how all of this began. Um, Oliver and I worked 2015 together in a blockchain startup and we loved the idea of apps running on blockchain technology. Um, and we wanted, or we saw a big problem in the space that there are too few blockchain developers because there was no really easy entry into the scene, into this development and so on. So we started in January list with the goal to make the entry easier um, and to make the world basically more decentralized by providing developers the necessary tools to develop blockchain technology. Um, a month later we did an ICO. Who's familiar with that concept? A few. So an ICO is basically something like an investment round in the crypto space. You're giving out your own currency and receiving Bitcoin in exchange with your own one. Um, and this way, nowadays, many startups in the space are raising funds. Um, we were one of the big first ones of 2016, and I think kickstarted the whole hype around it this uh, last year. Um, and this is our main source of income. Um, in May, we launched an alpha version of this, and for the rest of the year, we basically just spent development power on, op on optimizing, stabilizing, um, the list code base and pushing it to beta state. Um, now in 2017, we can concentrate on further refinements of the code base. We can optimize it, we can secure it even further. Um, but for me, as one of the big goals is to make it more accessible. That means we want to separate the front end from the back end, until it's like one big chunk of mass. Um, but we want to divide it into two different distinctive products so that each of them have, uh, has individual um, release cycles. With that I mean that basically everyone is just running a light line and if the light line detects that a core or backend system of, or a node of this uh, of LISC is running in the background, it just connects to this. Um, but if there is no core client running on the same system, it just connects to a random node on the network, so you don't have to sync with the blockchain anymore. Um, one, of the, well, one of the big projects of this year, which I am responsible for as well, is um, the rebranding. That means we are working together with one of the best Berlin design agencies um, to make something new. I, I think it's a big problem in the space currently that user experience is not really there. Um, that people from outside the space can get an easy entry. Um, that's why we are working with a design agency which um, might have not that much knowledge in cryptocurrencies or blockchain in general, but I think they can provide some fresh air and new ideas. Um, and of course you can't speak about user experience if you don't provide mobile clients. Um, and to give an outlook to the future, um, for LISC itself, it's just important that the system is robust, it's scalable and usable. 
Um, DPoS makes it quite scalable and easier to scale than proof of work, for example, um, because you have a federated system or a federated network. But in 2018 and also in 2017, you will see security audits, you will see low-level optimizations. And then another big topic are something what I call core blockchain layers. Um, it's basically utilizing a sidechain or building a, a, a decentralized app with our own SDK, um, which allows us to, for example, provide identities to list users, so you're not sending list to some strange address anymore, but actually send it to a normal name, for example. Um, that's it about Lisp. Lisp itself is quite simple. Um, so let's switch to the Lisp SDK, uh, which is basically our main product and the most interesting part of us. Um, for this, again, I first explain what a sidechain is. Okay? Um, so a sidechain is basically a new, fully customizable blockchain, which plugs into an existing blockchain ecosystem. In this case, this would be the Lisp main chain. And you have basically the Lisp blockchain or the main chain. And now just imagine there's some guy who developed the side chain. Um, you don't need to know how he developed it. He just developed it, it okay? And it's ready and he wants to deploy it. So he registers it on the main chain. Um, register means he can choose a name, he can choose a description can choose tags or maybe an icon. Um, and this way, he basically creates a new blockchain which is running in parallel um, and very important independently to the main chain. Um, and you see, for example, the lines are shorter, so that means the block time can be different, different parameters can be completely customized. Um, and all of this is happening really in parallel while the main chain is still progressing. Um, and now at the fifth block, someone else could deploy another side chain um, while the main chain is continuing like, like always. So that means you have like the main chain running, these are the gray blocks, and then in parallel you have new blockchains which are connected with one small link to the main chain, but which are mostly independent from the system itself. And this is quite fascinating because now you can create a parallel blockchain in which you can play around or experiment in like crazy, you could basically just destroy your own side chain, but the main chain wouldn't be affected at all. So you can really um, try out new things. Yeah? Can you speak louder? If I'm a developer, what's my advantage of creating a side chain on list rather than my own blockchain from scratch? Is it that the SDK yeah. Uh, so the question was, what is the advantage to use a sidechain instead of using or building your own blockchain? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I will first make the presentation and answer that at the end because maybe it becomes more clear of the presentation. Okay. Um, so the list SDK or it's, it's basically a software or sidechain development kit um, in which you can deploy and develop your own customizable sidechain which will act as the decentralized database of your blockchain app you want to develop. Um, this is all in development, it's quite early in the state, and we seek or we plan to make it a Node.js module, um, which implements all necessary functionalities and features of such a sidechain. This would be like peer-to-peer -peer communications, consensus algorithm, would be the networking, logic, and so on. Um, and we want to develop a private modular system so that every developer, we but also third-party developers, can develop their own Node.js modules, which they just plug into the system. So one could, for example, develop a token feature or a Node.js module for tokens, which everyone could simply plug into, and then he could have his own token on the sidechain beside the list token itself. Um, and we want that development is easy. What means easy? Uh, I think development is never easy, but um, we can at least try to make it as easy as possible. I would say web development is quite easy nowadays. And therefore, we are striving to make the feel and the look similar to regular web development. 
um, on the back end with Node.js, on the front end with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript itself. Um, and the SDK will also come with various tools to make the development itself easier uh, because you have to imagine you have your own side chain, so you have to manage it also in some way. Um, so one example of this to of a tool would be, for example, a script, which helps you to manage your side chain, to reset it or um, to deploy a, a test one while you're in development. Um, the timeline for that, and it's a really, really really rough timeline is that in 2016 we had the initial version um, but it was not good enough for us. Um, it consists of like several different JavaScript files and it was a mess and it was very complicated to get into it and you always saw like all source code while you were developing even though you didn't need to see it at all. Um, so that's why we used the whole year 2016 um, to concentrate on the list core, concentrate on the cryptocurrency list, um, and just push the SDK to the side for later. And now in 2017, we are finally in a, in a state where we can concentrate on it. Um, and um, basically, this year we will completely rewrite what we have currently into a Node.js module uh, for easier development and we'll probably end up with the first optional Node.js module so that developers can play around with the system. Um, so that means our whole SDK will be roughly available towards the end of the year with first blockchain apps popping up. Um, while next year we will get more sophisticated, the Node.js module will be more um, complex and more feature rich, same for the optional ones and for the development tools and so on. Um, and I hope that by then we can see more complex blockchain apps which uh, will really give some great use cases to the ecosystem. You have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question was why we use or use are using Node.js. Um, so before Lisp, we worked, um, or we were part of a startup um, called Crypti, and I think there's one member from the startup here as well. Um, and we decided to branch off to create a fork. Um, and Crypti initially used Node.js, um, so and we wanted to go with this code base, so we just progressed with it. Um, Additionally, it comes to the fact that my partner is a very good Node.js developer um, and we think that even though there are many criticisms and critical words about this language, um, we, or he believes and we believe both that we can provide something substantial, even if it's in Node.js, you know. I wouldn't say that it's like insecure or something like that or not fitting, and there are always ways around it. Um, okay, so when we are designing this whole thing right now, um, as you saw in the timeline, we basically just started this year. We're taking a very user-centric approach. Um, that means we're keeping our users in our minds at all times, um, because I think this is always very important for startups, um, because at the end, the users are those guys who are using your system. Um, and here we are taking a top to the bottom approach. That means First, we look out and brainstorm what kind of users do we have, um, e.g., for example, a developer, okay? And then we are asking ourselves, what do they want and what do they need? Um, for example, a developer needs security or wants a secure system, he wants a secure sidechain. Um, then we ask ourselves, going further down, uh, what belongs to this attribute security? Um, here you could say maybe determinism or immutability. Um, and then we're going down further, and then we can ask ourselves, what, is, what belongs to deterministic? Maybe it's a validator um, which checks if your code is really deterministic. Or to immutability, of course, the consensus algorithm is an important part of it. Um, and then we're further going down, checking out how could we solve these problems, and even further down, how to code it, and how to realize it. Um, and during these brainstorming sessions, we come up 
or we came up with fancy mind, grab, uh, mind maps. Um, for example, this one is a mind map for the stakeholders, for the, for the users of the system, like the investors, which invest into our, our ICO, but also delegates, which are securing the network, developers, which will develop, hopefully, with the SDK, um, and the users, which will later on use the apps, which were built on the SDK itself. And we can now take a look at, for example, the security one, so it goes further down um, the level. Um, and here we have all kinds of problems popping up, topics we really need to discuss and uh, think about while we are designing and planning the system. Um, and I earlier shows, for example, determinism, um, which is basically that everything what is happening happens everywhere. That means on one node A, if you execute something, it should happen, or the result of it should be exactly the same on the node B. Um, else you can't reach consensus within the network if everyone has a different result, right? Um, so there were multiple questions we had to ask ourselves in this category. So for example, JavaScript, like you asked, if, is JavaScript really a language um, which makes sense for this um, task we set ourselves, or should we use some DSL, or should we come up with our own language? Um, same for number accuracy, function blacklisting, there's some functions which introduce random numbers, for example. You can never have them in such a sidechain ecosystem, because this would not be deterministic, right? Um, same goes for third-party libraries, um, third-party libraries in Node.js. Uh, which needs to be blacklisted because else your app becomes undeterministic. Um, then it also maybe makes sense to introduce standards which everyone can rely on and know, okay, these are deterministic libraries I can use. Um, I already mentioned the code validator or linter, which might be a script which checks your code and checks if you use any function or any library which might not be deterministic. So it can give you an output, yes, you're your sidechain code is good. Um, and of course, documentation and guidelines is also something to think about. Um, so you see there are many different topics you have to think about when you're designing such a, di such a difficult system. Um, we could, you saw this already, we could take another um, point, for example, immutability, um, so that once the chain had consensus on something, it can never be changed again. Um, so here you have topics like the network consensus algorithm. Does it make sense that we choose a standard one like DPoS on our main chain, or should we be should we be more flexible and allow that anyone can come up with his own consensus algorithm? We need to choose a database or a persistence layer for the backend uh, where the files or the data is saved on. Um, and then some quite interesting topics are these cementations, so we call them. Um, these are basically points in the blockchain which can never be reworded again. On the main chain, um, this would come through consensus from the delegates, and this would mean that basically at this point you can, well, you could cut off the old part and make the blockchain smaller again. Um, and on side chains, this could mean that you create a hash at a specific point and save this on the main chain, which is probably the most secure blockchain in this ecosystem. Um, so there are quite a few interesting facts to think about. Um, as the last one, I wanted to talk about one which is more for users. Um, this is the accessibility. Um, and we really want to make the system easy. Not easy for developers only, but also later on for the users which are using it. Um, so, which are using the apps being built on. So, let's pick one category called App Launch. Um, this is like how you launch an app which were built with this SDK, which was registered on the main chain and is now available for users. And when I'm talking about an app, I just talk about sidechain, because at the end, the sidechain is implementing some use case and becomes an app. Um, and I think nowadays users don't want to install an app, and especially not a decentralized one, because they would have to synchronize it maybe, they would have to download all those files and keep them secure and so on. Um, 
I think he just wants to click on the icon and just launch the app immediately. So let's say that's one of you guys, you now have, uh, or you're now in the list line and want to run or launch an app. Um, and you've set up your node, let's say it like this. And now you want, you're a part of this huge network of lists, okay? Um, as I said in the beginning, there are about 600 nodes or peers on the network. Um, and some of them have specific side chains installed. That means they're, they're keeping in synchronization with these side chains um, and basically are creating these sub-networks. Um, that means all the dots are the whole list network and the dots within the circle A are just um, on one side part of the list network, but on the other side um, they are synchronizing to a side chain A, uh, which whatever it implements. Um, and now you as a user want to use this app um, and you don't want to install it, so you need to find a way to it. Um, so you just connect to a random node basically and see, oh yeah, this node doesn't have it installed, so I need to look further. So you're looking further and there you got a node which has this app installed. So basically it's a routing process uh, where you're looking for, for a node on the network which have uh, which has this app installed or which is in sync with this sidechain. Um, that means as a user, you don't have to download the app, synchronize the app, um, and then launch it. You can just launch it with one click. So this is also just one small point in this huge mind map I showed you earlier, uh, which has like hundreds of different attributes and categories, um, and it's going really deep, you know. Um, so. The end goal for the SDK is, like I said it like 10 times already, is to make it easy to use for beginners and advanced users and companies. Um, we want to make blockchain technology more accessible with it. Um, and with more accessible, we get more blockchain developers and developments into the space. Um, with that, we get more blockchain experiments. With more experiments, we get more applications, which makes sense. Um, and if we end up with like hundreds of different blockchain applications, we basically have a more decentralized and trustless world in which not the big corporation apps um, are the big players, but maybe some decentralized apps as well. Um, so these are the two products we're working on, Lisp and the Lisp SDK. And I think the real power starts when we combine them both. Okay. Um, so on the one side we have cryptocurrency, we have decentralized networks with a lot of users, with a big community behind it, um, with a financial ecosystem of like a few million dollars market cap and a few hundred thousand dollars volume every day. Um, and now the developer can leverage this system and, or this community and the community can um, make use of all these apps the developers are coding. Um, and by combining these two products, basically, we get many benefits. For example, a developer um, now has something like an app directory, which is inbuilt in the client to directly distribute his blockchain app to interested users. Um, he also has a strong financial ecosystem to monetize his app because every app uh, has access to a cryptocurrency, so every user of the app should have some money with it, which he can spend easily. Um, something called the Delegate Marketplace um, is it's basically a feature we want to implement um, to make it more easy for sidechain developers to find nodes, find people um, which are securing his sidechain, uh, because this might be one of the biggest disadvantages of this whole system, that each sidechain needs to be secured by some nodes. Um, so you need to find these nodes first. Um, but the other big benefit of this is that the, the whole system can easier scale up. Because um, you don't have every app running on one blockchain only, but on several ones. Um, and another benefit is that the network itself is ever evolving. Um, with new features coming out on different sidechains, which then can be used again in other sidechains. For example, you could have one identity app and one app which allows you to upload a file. 
and you combine them to create some social media, Instagram or whatever. Um, and for users, of course, this also has a big advantage because Lisp itself becomes something like a go-to hub for all kinds of decentralized blockchain applications. Um, and it could be something like a daily center of decentralized financial, social and entertainment interactions. Um, just like your smartphone is today, on the layer above is its Lisp, which becomes your smartphone basically for decentralized stuff. Um, and it's quite good for the user because all these apps can, not must, but can use Lisp for the features. For example, you could pay within a decentralized online shop directly with the Lisp code. Or you could create an identity within an identity app against a fee in Lisp. So if you have some Lisp, you can easily spend it in the whole system and it makes it very easy for you to um, get empowered by these apps. Uh, for example, I wanted to book a, a room here in America for, on Airbnb and it was not possible because PayPal was somehow not working in this moment so I couldn't book this room. Um, and this could be eliminated with such a system. Um, and just as a small last slide, some examples you could build with such a SDK. Um, here I'm again dividing between blockchain layers or blockchain protocols and applications itself. Uh, for me, a blockchain layer or a blockchain protocol is something which provides like basic functionalities or basic feature like an identity or a reputation or something like an e-commerce store for the world. Why should it be divided between like 1,000 different stores? It could be one huge decentralized one, right? Um, or sharing economies, same thing. Um, another quite interesting protocol might be something like unique digital items. Currently, you could just copy and paste any digital item you have, but if you associate, associate them with maybe some ID on blockchain, you could prove that you own this one digital item, maybe in a game or whatever. Um, so these are examples for protocols which can leverage the blockchain um, but there are of course also many application use cases. Um, for example, all applications which involve somehow the transfer of metadata, rights and money. Um, I can think about games, for example, we could win some money as a prize at the end, um, social media or any s single purpose use cases. With that I mean like a, like a store of one, uh, of one um, yeah, company or maybe um, you have one game and you just want to develop something for yourself without getting in the, into the wider world. Um, so you're developing a single purpose side chain just for yourself or your app, whatever you want to do. Um, and in general, blockchain is always useful for high security and availability level stuff, like in the FinTech world, in the GovTech world, and for different kinds of services so that they are always available. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just just because just because we have a lot of people, so I make it here. I'm gonna be walking around the microphone. If you raise your hand, I'll give you one. If for some reason you ask it anyways, just repeat the question. Uh, all right. So I saw Andre. There you go. Could you explain how? A distributed proof of stake system protects the side chains because I, I, I didn't get what they had to decide the ability to use the cards. Mm -hmm. So the question was how proof of stake, or in our case, delegated proof of stake, secures the side chain, right? Right. Yeah. So um, in a delegated proof of stake system, you have many different delegates, um, which basically needs to be voted in in order to secure the network, the main chain. Okay. That means those who have basically the highest, um, the highest rate of, like, okay, let's say, let's say you have list. That means you have votes on the network. Okay. I understand how it works for currency, but how yeah. is it useful for the data of the side chains? So basically, this is the same thing. You have a side chain or a blockchain, so it could work in exactly the same way. 
Um, but there are many different ways how you could realize that. You could realize it with votes, you could realize it with a delegate marketplace where you as an app owners just pay for it. You could realize it with like you're scratching the delegates and just making it a proof of stake system. Does it mean that each side chain has its own security system and level and the main network is not protected on the side? Exactly, yeah, else it couldn't be scaled up, you know. So there are no benefits besides the shared currency um, within the side chain. So, like, so the side chain. Well, there's a benefit, like you said, of the shared currency that you can plug in into the next system. system. Same for the community, which you can directly leverage. Um, but the goal is to make the development itself easier, you know? So even if there isn't like a huge advantage of um, having a sidechain instead of a blockchain, try developing a blockchain. Okay? It's freaking hard. Um, and with our SDK, you can at least build a sidechain in the beginning. And if it turns out that the sidechain becomes hugely successful, you can branch it out into your own project, into your own blockchain itself, you know? Okay, thank you. Okay. So what language are these sidechains in? Open source, and is it going to be running on my machine? Yeah, so uh, you're asking for the programming language? Yeah, everything, everything is done in Node.js, so JavaScript. And is every, is every sidechain open source? Um, well, at the end, the SDK is of course open source. So I'm going to be running other people's side chains on my machine. Yeah. So yeah. So um, closed source. So every developer could choose if he open sources his side chain or not, of course. But at the end, JavaScript is nearly always open source, and you can hide the code with scramblers or so. Uh, but in a sense, yes, they're open source. So it's running on my hardware. Um, it as it well, it depends. If you just connect to a node which has it installed, like I explained, so it's not running locally, you just connect to it I like a website. A, I be a node. What do you mean? I want to be a node. Yeah, so, yeah. so as a node you can run list itself, and then you can install different sidechains, and then they're running on your hardware, yes. Okay, I mean, that's a problem. So it doesn't choose which sidechains? Are you okay there? Does he choose which sidechains he wants to run? Yeah, so every node can choose which sidechain he installs. Um, he has all power over it. It's not an automatic process, it's a manual process. Yeah. What is the Yeah. I, mean, I can talk really loud. Okay. What is the risk associated with running a sidechain for somebody in the node? Yeah, so the risk associated with running a sidechain. So the risk could be like, um, like if it's an unproven, anonymous sidechain, you don't know who's the original developer, it could have like a malicious code, which is stealing your money, which is installing a virus on your, on your system. Um, but I would say... Does it have that level of privilege? I mean, is it using my computer resources at will? Um, so you could... Uh, okay, it's, uh, you're, you're asking like, if it's if it could run a program, which so what, what what consists of the what is the, the code that it's running in the sidechain consist of? What so, operations are running on my node? So I guess that's the question. Yeah. Like, like my perception of I think most people here are perceiving like Bitcoin, for example, if you're running a miner, you're hashing, which is not not going to be not open up your computer vulnerability. Yeah. But if you're running a side chain with this, what kind of computations am I doing with my computer? Yeah. With my okay, okay. So, um, list side chains or list itself is using delegate proof of stake. It's a consensus algorithm where you're not mining. Um, it's practically very simple. You, you have a fixed set of delegates which are um, securing the network, which are generating new blocks, and the, um, the order of these delegates are always random every round, okay? And the way they get elected is um, the proof of stake element. That means that users can vote for them with their stake, and those delegates with the highest votes will get elected into the top 101, and these are the delegates which are securing the network itself. Um, and the same thing can be applied to sidechains and will be applied to our sidechains. Um, that means it's again very efficient, very lightweight. Again, there's no mining in it. Um, and that means you could also run like 50 sidechains on one node. Okay? 
if it's not like a heavy popular side chain. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So, uh, so assume that the, the main chain is uh, has the transactional data, uh, where the side chain could have attribute-based data or some kind of your application from mm -hmm. whatever app that's running. Uh, it, it, yeah. So, I, yeah. so I understand that you could have uh, you could share functionality between other side chains, right? Like that are different apps running. So, what's in, how is the data being handled? Is there a possibility of like you kind of like seeping in data seeping into like how 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 will, if I'm running an app on the like side chain, what is how is that data secure and like uh, I mean what's what's the boundaries around that? Um, you mean where to save data? What, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so, by the way. Yeah, yeah. so blockchain is not used for saving big files of data, right? It's only for metadata, for transactional data, for states, for transferring of rights and permissions and so on. Um, so if you're developing a blockchain app, which requires to save a lot of data, for example pictures, you need to plug it into another system, into a third party system, which takes care of that. Um, of course, at the end, someone could develop such a system with the Risk SDK by providing or developing a system where he saves basically links to files on the sidechain and nothing more. And if you're requesting a file, it just picks where it is. Maybe it could be on seven delegates of this sidechain and gets replicated and split it throughout the network, so it's always available. Um, and then you as an app developer could plug into this sidechain and use it for storing your data. Or could every host host their own data? Yeah, sure. You could, also, yeah, you could also implement a system where every delegate has to save the data locally. Um, the question here is how scalable it is, um, but at the end the delegate could be a huge cluster of nodes again, you know. Um, so, yeah, you could also do it like this, that, for example, pictures or movies, they have to be saved locally. Um, but again, here's the question, does it make sense to use a blockchain for these kind of applications, right? Um, I think it makes more sense, for example, to use the blockchain to um, take care of the payment for this data. For example, if you are a video provider and you want to monetize it somehow, so that your users get paid for providing videos, then here it makes sense to use blockchain technology, but not for actual storing of the files or handling of this storage. Uh, but you mentioned like the world marketplace, like, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's like this could be like a world marketplace. I work, I come from a marketplace environment. What we do is that we store people's uh, products, right? Like people are selling, them. that's a marketplace. Right? Yeah. So can every individual, let's say a server that's a the work, every individual as part of the marketplace could either act as a node or could act as an app or is there I'm not maybe a number distinction and host their own data and somewhere along the line that they, like even if that node is not available but there's somewhere that state is maintained so that like somebody else you know if I'm offline I want to make sure that what I'm selling is still available. Mm -hmm. So the question was that your background is e-commerce and you're saying like in a worldwide marketplace where to save these files, for example, pictures of your, of your item. Right. Um, and one part of the question was like if you could enforce, this, enforce it that every user uh, stores all these files locally as well, right? Um, that every user is a node or just plugs into yeah. a node, yeah. So, um, well, every user could be a node, but I think this would not have the best user experience. I explained this live uh, client way to connect to nodes which have this um, application installed. Um, I think this is a better way. But yeah, you could have like a, yeah, I would say a network of very high performance um, servers which are storing all these files locally um, and then they are pretty much accessible, distributed all over the world. Imagine you have 100 delegates which all have very powerful and performance service running um, and they are storing all the images of the items on the marketplace. Um, that means you have 100 locations throughout the world where you can access those files. Okay? And pictures are not that big, so it might be possible that this uh, will be done in this way. You know? yeah. Hi. Um, can you explain a little bit about your ICO? Um, why? Uh, be 
what is the utility of the list um, token is right now, uh, since you're rebuilding. And uh, just give us a sense of the, the token itself and, and why it's got value and what you plan to do with it. Um, so, first of all, why we did an ICO. Um, I would say the ICO is by now the standard for investment in this space. If you're developing your own currency, you're doing an ICO. Okay? Um, so, for us, it was an easy way to get money while um, building instantly a community. Because you get now all these kinds of investors and they are now forming a community. That means you don't start with zero members, but in our case we have 4,000 investors, so we start with 4,000 users using our system, using our platform. Okay? Oh, sorry. So the investors are all users, they're not speculating? Um, well, I think mo many of them are just speculating on the price going up, um, but at least you have an initial user base which cares about your product, you know? I think this is very important, which plugs into your... I'm sorry, you say cares about your product, your product's not really useful. So, so yeah. I don't say, what is it they care about? Yeah. This yeah, and this plugs into your third question, which what gives it value? And I think value is always um, perceived about the potential of something, so they are looking forward to something, to something usable, to something accessible, um, and they see, okay, we, we are planning this list SDK, they see this could be quite useful uh, for experimentation, for actual blockchain apps later on, so I would say our current users, they want to see this product, the list SDK reality. So they're supporting us, they're supporting the community, they're buying the token um, in order to make this happen, you know. While the investor, they speculate that when we deliver this, the price will shoot up, you know. Um, can you repeat your second question? Okay, I answer. Thank you. Actually, related question. That may be the same answer, right? What's my incentive? I might have missed this earlier. What's my incentive to run a note? Do I earn, not mine my, my earning additional currency, or is it because I've already invested in Bitcoin? Or, and then within that, once I'm running a note, how do I choose which which app I want to use? Okay, so um, there can be many reasons to run a note. Um, it could be like you're an enthusiast, you're supporting, you just want to support the network, like you're running a Bitcoin node, a full node. You don't get anything back. Um, it might. In theory, these days it's a little likely, but in theory it could. Uh, what do you mean? A mining. A mining. Ah, mining, yeah. But this would require additional hardware, right? Um, a normal full node is just a server which you can rent for 5, 10, 15, 20 dollars. Um, it could be a virtual one as well. It doesn't need to be a dedicated one. And that's it, okay? Um, that's for the enthusiasts. But those delegates I mentioned earlier on the main chain, they get a reward for securing the network. For every block they generate, they receive five list tokens, um, which is currently about, I think, 70 cents or so. Um, that means they get an incentive to actively secure the network, to provide the best server setup possible, to provide a near 100% uptime and so on, financial incentive. Um, but um, speaking about sidechains now, why or how you choose which sidechain to secure, um, this is, I think, purely um, like those sidechains you want to support, those are the ones you're going to secure. Um, at least in the beginning. You will see like this one guy developing the best uh, decentralized messaging server, and you think it's an, an awesome idea, you want to support him. So at the beginning, you just provide an offer this, because it costs you like five or ten dollars a month, um, and in exchange you get you, you get this app, okay, which you can use. Maybe it's very valuable for you to use this app in your daily life. Uh, for example, Google is shutting sometimes some apps off, like from one day to another, um, and then there may be a few thousand users which are missing this app. But in this case, it's decentralized, so as long as the users which are using this app, they could provide a node um, and it would run indefinitely, okay? But again, there could also be an incentive inbuilt into the sidechain. For example, the owner, the operator, could make profits with this app um, and he could pay 
this delegates a small amount of money for securing it. Um, or you could um, like accrue all network fees happening on the sidechain because if you send a message, it costs one list. So this is a network fee, um, and the delegates get like maybe 70% of all those network fees. You know? There are different ways. Okay, so the, it's interesting. So the, so the bottom line is, as an application developer, it's something I've got to think about. I've got to think about how am I going to motivate members of the community to, to, to you know, run my, my app. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's also quite interesting to think about what is really possible. Like you could build a decentralized app, but you can also build a decentralized and trustless app. That means a decentralized app, you could provide one of the nodes itself. It's decentralized, it's running on the blockchain, but the trust is actually centralized. Sometimes this might be enough, you know, but then you could also like make it trustless, like getting many different users securing it. Um, which is probably the end goal of everyone here. Um, and then you really have to think about how to incentivize this to actively secure it. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Thanks. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation. It was great. So, um, my question is quite simple. It's essentially, where do you find most of your user bases located? And do you have any plans to list on Chinese or Asian exchanges? Yeah. Um, so, I would say the most users of this coming from China, America, and Germany. Um, and um, well, I, I've been in China two times last year. I've been to various uh, various conferences, gave presentations, speaking to uh, IBM and other uh, companies involved in this space. Um, so we are actively trying to spread awareness in this country, right? Um, and we have something called the LISC Ambassador Program. This is basically a, a grassroots effort where users which are very motivated can become ambassadors in their countries and promote it there. Um, we have ambassadors in China, we have an ambassador in Romania, in, uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in um, basically in Puerto Rico and all over the world, okay? Um, and they're very active promoting it, um, spreading the word, and just helping out in a grassroots effort, even though it's still so damn early now. So this is the last question. Then we're gonna have uh, just a few quick lightning talks, and uh, we're gonna head off, get more beer off, come on Okay, thank you guys. Ah, one more, okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so unlike the other people here, I, I don't want to run a full node, I just want to use the light file. Could you talk a little bit about the process by which I would connect and get and make sure that I'm talking to a lot of can you, can you repeat the last part? Uh, how, how can I make sure that I'm talking to a lot of Can you talk a little bit about the connection process? Okay. So, this is a very hard question. Um, like, what is an honest note, right? Um, I think for sidechains, you can implement features. Um, for example, one feature could be you take a hash of the local app, because the node is running, and this hash is safe on the blockchain. So it's like a versioning system for decentralized app or for blockchain applications of the Lisk SDK. And every time someone is connecting to a node, he checks that the files is is uh, executing or using um, are exactly the files which the developer uploaded, you know, or which the developer intended to be. Um, this could be one, one, well, one option how to secure a user. Um, at the end, everything will have to happen through the community, through review systems and ratings. Like, okay, this app is honest. Um, and this app only signs all transactions locally, it's running in a great DM, and the user is secure using it, you know? Um, I think it would spread very quickly if an app is malicious. Um, and an honest note, I don't, I think if we implement this correctly, like with a good DM, it's not even possible to connect to an, un -on to an inhonest uh, node because it would run in the VM anyways. That means in an encapsulated sandbox, even if it is doing some shit, it won't even affect the system, you know? Okay? Thanks. Okay, thank you guys.
the lineup. First, we have Dave, as they talk about We Trust. Just a few of these, one minute each, real quick. Here we go. Thank you, Travis. Real quick, uh, so many of you probably know me from Coindesk. I've done many events around here. I am advising a project called WeTrust. It is a savings and credit and insurance project on the blockchain. They will be speaking at the next event in full about the project. I'm very excited about it. They have a great team. Uh, the two founders are from Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, one of them worked at Google for several years. One of them worked at Ernst & Young. Uh, and that's going to be February 28th. They're going to talk more about it. It's called WeTrust. That's WeTrust.io. Uh, and thank you, Travis. I'll let the next person go. Thanks, Daniel. It'll be on February 28th, WeTrust speaker. And uh, Daniel again. Hey, I'm Daniel with Modesty. Uh, I do community building around tea. I work a lot in the lower eight and at festivals. There's an organization called the Fleet Street Commons, which we do a lot of uh, activities for the 50th anniversary as the Summer of Love. And I came here tonight because my biggest problem with my website right now is that I can't take Bitcoin on reoccurring payments. And I was wondering if somebody might be able to help me with that. My biggest product is a Tea of the Month Club. And if anybody's a tea nerd out there, then look me up. We've got some tea in the back. And I guess I'll let the other person go. I don't know how long that's been. Hello, my name is Alex and with the Robot Sea Monster Teams and I was wondering if I can have a show of hands who is playing video games. Video games? Anyone? Okay, three of you. Okay. Who is excited about virtual reality? Okay, a little bit more. That's good. So we're starting a VR blockchain company and if if anyone wants to learn more details or see a live demo, please hit me up after the talk. Thank you. Hi everyone. We're still launching tokens and currencies. So I'm the CEO of MSafe. Uh, we've been in the space for two years and currently we have like 10 or more ICO projects work in progress. And they are different in a way that tokens that we issue for companies actually have legal power in certain jurisdictions. So the holder of the token can sue the issuer of the token if he, uh, he is not fulfilling his promises. And we have a lot of interesting, going, of interesting stuff going on and we are looking for um, security as attorney, as a co-founder or part-time consultant who are interested to, uh, to bring this solution to the US. Bitcoin Hong Kong Association, so uh, I frequently I, I frequently visit San Francisco. So uh, if you're ever in Hong Kong or if your company's ever in Hong Kong, we host a lot of visiting uh, Bitcoin slash blockchain companies to give a talk. Um, we stand as a, the main educational resource on Bitcoin, blockchain, and crypto in general in Hong Kong for the community, for government agencies, and for the companies. So if you have any questions or you're coming by, um, my email is dominique at bitcoinhk.org. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Or if you're coming by, thanks. Thank you very much. I always seem last. So essentially, um, I act, well, our company acts as an OTC layer between Chinese miners and exchanges. So if you're looking to provide liquidity to your exchange through cheap bitcoins or something like that, come talk to me and we can set up some contract and maybe work together. Thank you. Thank you.